Yes, um, one of the main objectives of this session is to, um, well, um, to raise and discuss new questions that we would want to see as, as uh, the part of the salutogenesis family, new questions to be addressed by salutogenesis. And secondly, also explore applications of salutogenesis beyond, beyond health. As, as, you, as you're rightfully aware, as I mentioned earlier, that the theme of, of this conference, of this pre-conference is salutogenesis beyond health. So we want to see what else we could explore to, to advance both um, theory and practice of salutogenesis. And we hope that at the end of, of this session, um, we would have a clear understanding and hopefully more consensus on the next steps regarding what is needed to be explored in terms of research as well as in practice. And, um, Lastly, but not least, uh, we hope that the salutogenesis family would grow in terms of um, numbers and, and, and quality. Um, our agenda, Kiel, our agenda. Yes, so um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a plenary as well as breakout, uh, breakout sessions. Um, I provide the introduction, introductory remarks, and um, in a short while, uh, Gail will be presenting introdu an introduction to salutogenesis before we will move, we'll be moving out into sessions. But before the sessions, we'll also have a, a brief summary, kind of like a teaser, an appetizer of what will happen in each of the, each of the, of the breakout rooms. Um, there are, so we will encourage all our participants because we will have, we are planning to have two breakout, uh, breakout sessions for discussion. So we'll encourage you to sign up for one uh, at the beginning. And then when we return, uh, then you, you, after that one, you'll also sign up for another. To encourage, we're encouraging you to explore a bit more. Although it's not prescriptive, you can choose to remain in the same breakout room, but we hope that you'll consider exploring uh, alternative rooms as part of the, sec uh, part of the second session. Um, I don't want to go into the details as they're presented on the screen, but then uh, so there after, after the breakout rooms uh, sessions, we'll be returning to the plenary where we'd have um, a brief, a brief um, this is going to really be interesting from Shifra. Um, it's a, responding to a question about what Antonovsky would say today if, if he were here. And thereafter we'll close and we hope that, well, we'll have achieved the outcomes at the, at the end of this session. And so moving on, the sessions, we have five themes for the, the breakout sessions. Uh, the first, led by, led by, presented by Eddie and Shifra, is one on interrelations between individual and collective sense of coherence in times of crisis. Uh, the second, led by Claudia, Ruka, and Matthew, is uh, applying salutogenesis to advance coherent societies. While the third, um, this would be moderated by Ben, Lenica, and Laura. This is genesis of salutogenesis in the beginning of life. While the fourth, um, presented by Georg and uh, Sheffoli, that is health beyond ease and the individual. While last but not least, Grit, Eva, and, and, um, and Louis will present, uh, will lead the discussion on salutogenesis guiding health promotion action. So thank you very much. We, uh, we hope that we'll have a productive, a productive session today. And hopefully as we grow the society, the, the society of salutogenesis beyond what we currently have, those that have not been part of this would join us so that we can grow the body of knowledge around salutogenesis. And uh, now I'm proudly happy to present to, to, to lead you on to the next session uh, by Gail, who will be taking us through an introduction to salutogenesis. Over. Thank you. Good. Um, 
Thank you very much, uh, Pauline, for this nice introduction to our meeting. Uh, now, uh, in my role as the chair of Global Working Group of Strategy Genesis, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to give a short uh, introduction to Strategy Genesis. As we have seen in this poll, we have a quite normal distribution of participants. Even one third is really rather new uh, to the field. So please hang on, uh, but I also give some background information first, because then in the second part of my short intro, I will also show how we think we should advance Strategy Genesis in the future. Uh, in a nutshell, you find this definition of WHO, which we provided uh, to this group, that salutogenesis really is about the study of the origins, the genesis of health in Latin salus, and this is exactly the word salutogenesis, uh, the origin of health rather than disease. And as you see here, it describes how social and individual resources, including the sense of coherence, help people to manage stress and to thrive. So that's in short, uh, our definition of salutogenesis. So where is it coming from? Uh, most of you uh, certainly will know that uh, the original author of this concept um, has been uh, Aaron Antonovsky. Um, he has really uh, written two seminal books who were introducing this idea and developing it really deeply uh, in these books. Um, and again, uh, the first uh, big contribution is really this new question of uh, what is the origin of health rather than disease. And in addition to this question, which is certainly a very intriguing question, he also really provided us with this, I think, very uh, clear term of salutogenesis, really making very clear that it is a mirror concept uh, really uh, towards pathogenesis. And in a nutshell, again, I mean, I can only summarize two books here. Um, instead of risk factors, he really uh, suggested uh, to balance on life stressors and resources at the same time, which help us to really deal uh, with the life stressors. And instead of, as pathogenesis does, looking at single disease outcomes, he really suggested to look broadly um, as a, at the overall development of health of a human being over the life course, but also in a certain period of time. Uh, and he proposed this ease disease as a continuum. So that's in a nutshell, uh, the original uh, idea of Antonovsky. And as we now already have seen at the very core, certainly uh, in his uh, theory, uh, he proposed this sense of coherence. Uh, basically, he said, based on his own research he had uh, conducted, he really found out that this uh, concept of this global orientation to life of human beings uh, is really the core to really moving more to the east end of the east disease continuum. And as you uh, probably all know, it has these three uh, dimensions, conceptually at least, uh, this comprehensibility, more the cognitive side, that I can find some order and predictability, uh, predictivity, or can predict what is happening around me, uh, and the manageability that I find appropriate resources to deal with stresses. And last not least, I find some deeper meaning uh, about what is going on in my life. And he did not only provide us with this uh, idea, with this concept of uh, sense of coherence, but also with a uh, respective measure, uh, the sense of coherence scale, uh, which uh, has been translated in over 50 languages actually by now, and really has a strong uh, evidence uh, when we look at the broad body of literature that it's really very protective and promotive uh, for our health. So that's uh, basically in the essence uh, what he uh, had uh, been developing and offering uh, to us. Uh, meanwhile, certainly this uh, field has grown a lot. Uh, this is reflected in the second handbook of Solid Genesis with around 600 pages where you can see all these uh, developments. In the introductory chapter, Maurice and I uh, summarize that we really mean by cytogenesis has taken on three distinct uh, meanings. On the other hand, this more overall positive orientation uh, really taken up uh, in health promotion, particularly really focusing on resources in uh, the environment of people, which will lead to well-being as a positive outcome. Certainly the sense of coherence as one uh, core element. 
And then we shouldn't forget that really Antonovsky had been developing this huge complex theory, which is depicted here uh, with all its complex relationships, because he was very much following a systems perspective, how health develops. And probably this model really hasn't been taken up so much because it is so complex. And this is why uh, other people already uh, propose to really simplify this model, which is depicted here. You see uh, all this uh, uh, circularity is really reduced to one uh, horizontal arrow, which uh, is uh, the idea is that all these elements here on, on the slide are interconnected. Uh, at the core, there's still certainly the sense of coherence, my orientation towards life, when I have a strong sense of coherence, then on the very left hand side in diverse life situations, I will reassess stresses as something I can deal with. I will be able to identify and also utilize, use uh, the uh, key resistance resources to deal uh, with the stressors. And by doing so, I will have this uh, life experience where my life is uh, uh, perceived or yeah, provides me some consistency. I will uh, have this load balance between stressors and uh, these resources which help me to deal with this uh, stressors so they are in a balance. And I won't feel as a passive human being, but really as an actor who can participate uh, actively and really deal with this life situations in a proactive way. Um, and by that, by this uh, life experience, I again will strengthen my sense of coherence and we can, we can imagine this kind of even upward gain cycles where the strength of SOC really leads to more um, consistent life experiences. And that in the end will certainly also contribute that I move more towards the ease end of uh, this ease disease continuum. So by that, we now have an overview of this model. Uh, can we as a global working group think that also this model could be uh, even improved because originally Antonovsky was really perceiving this ease and uh, more in a negatively defined way as an absence of pain, functional limitation and so on. So I think here we could add a more a positive uh, dimension of health. Uh, on the left-hand side, resources are certainly key but resources do not only help us to resist negative things, but also to perceive life as something positive that I can grow and develop and find my own purpose and achieve my life goals. So there should be something life thriving resources. And last but not least, um, many have really uh, certainly focused on the sense of coherence as the essence of the model. But because the sense of coherence is really primarily a orientation, a perception, a personal resource that might be a little bit too limit, limited when we really think about uh, the creation of health in a more comprehensive way. I uh, think about coherent societies for people to reflect on. So this is why uh, I proposed this completed cytotogenic model of health that just on the left hand side would add to the resistance resources this core idea that there are also in addition thriving resources which on the right hand side would not only move us up to the way of ease, but even beyond ease in the sense that I perceive something positive, this purpose of life, my life goes and so on. And in the center, maybe we could, in addition, I'm not saying we should throw out sense of coherence at all, but in addition, we could maybe focus more, uh, yeah, more heavily in our research and practice of really creating coherent life experiences, which then certainly would also increase sense of coherence. And with that, I'm at the end. Uh, why did we choose uh, this uh, topic of our conference, pre-conference uh, today? Uh, beyond health and towards coherent societies, exactly because we have huge challenges uh, about conflicts, migration, uh, planetary health, and so on. And that all can only be uh, really addressed well when we look beyond health of the individual, move it up on the very left-hand side to the planet understood as a complex system of unity in diversity. I really love that uh, term, which has uh, been created by Siona Tuetai from uh, the IOHP Global Working Group on Planetary Health, really a complex system of unity in diversity. And for that, we really need this more coherent life experiences. And I added here equitable 
coherent life experience on all these different levels, which would really lead to more holistic, balanced, negotiated outcomes. That's uh, what we would like to discuss with you today. And with that, I move on to my colleagues. So the first group who will introduce now what they would like to discuss with you is Adi and Shifra. Thank you. Adi. Thank you very Shifra. much, Georg. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, introduction about uh, salutogenesis and sense of coherence. In five minutes, it's not so easy to do it. Uh, we are, uh, our team is Adi and me. We are coming from Ben Gurion University, from the university where Aaron Antonovsky <clears throat> developed his uh, new paradigm, I would say, the salutogenesis. And what we are what wishing, well, what we would present here is about moving from the individual to the collective coping resource of the sense of coherence. So Antonovsky model uh, originally, and especially its core concept of the sense of coherence, focuses on the ability of individuals to deal with stressors in life and stay healthy. The sense of coherence of the individual contributes to successful coping and as a result to emotional and physical health. This is the main assumption, main hypothesis of the salutogenesis. And findings from all over the world during the past 40 years have indeed confirmed this basic hypothesis of the salutogenic model with regard to the individual. But what we ask now is, can we transform an individual concept into a collective measure? Does it make any sense to speak of a collective as perceiving the world as coherent? At the philosophical level, the question is, does a collective, a community, a war group, an ethnic group, a nation, have a mind which perceives? This question has challenged me while I was a doctoral student and my unique, wise and inspiring mentor was Professor Aaron Antonovsky many years ago, I must admit. <clears throat> I was a family therapist and wondered whether his research proposal, it was the first research proposal uh, large scale about retirees' sense of coherence and their health was the best way to understand the transition in life of retirement. So <clears throat> I cautiously told him when he asked my opinion about this proposal and say to him, I think you are wrong when you are investigating the individual retirees. It is the family system who retires. Then a year later, while Aaron was on a sabbatical in Sweden, I had a stimulating, irritating and mostly inspiring discussion with him but it was by regular mail, there was all days. And we discussed this philosophical question of what is collective sense of coherence and does this concept has any meaning at all? His question were very hard and I want you to hear them. My main theoretical, it was, is there any meaning to the collective sense of coherence. And if there is, where it is located, where do, do you put it? So my main, uh, I will not go into, I have only, we have very few minutes. So my main theoretical contention, as you can see in the slide, <clears throat> was that the individual sees the world as coherent is as much an abstraction from whatever objective reality 
may be, as is the phrase, the family, the community, or the nation sees the world as coherent. At last, the results of uh, my doctoral studies on the family sense of coherence what <clears throat> that showed that the family sense of coherence was a better predictor, predictor of the retiree's health convinced my mentor. Since then, the idea that the sense of coherence concept could be broadened to collective levels rather than individuals had been studying extensively. Research has revealed the contribution of sense of coherence at the family, community, and national levels on individuals' well being and on their ability to face crises and difficulties in life. However, the question of measurement or how the collective sense of coherence can be measured is still open. Actually, I believe we are still at a stage that does not enable a satisfactory operational translation of a complex collective concept like community or national sense of coherence. Another important question that I would like to raise here is that the salutogenic research over almost four decades focused mainly on the relationships between sense of coherence and health, while other social concepts have been mostly neglected. It's not the case now. In our chapter in the handbook, Adi and I claim that broadening the concept of sense of coherence from the individual to the collective level should be followed by altering the previous salutogenic research question from focusing only on health issues to considering social concept as well. So I'm glad that this meeting indeed deals with salutogenesis beyond health. When we employ such an approach, the salutogenic question would not only be who copes successfully and stays healthy, but also, for example, who expresses more openness to the other? Who is a social activist? Who pursues justice in the world? Or who will be a peacemaker in this world? These salutogenic questions are very meaningful, of course, in our violent, conflictual world. And now, Adi, your turn. Continue. Okay. Um, so during the last 10 uh, years, we at the Martin Springer Center for Conflict Studies explored sense of coherence at the community and national level in different social contexts, various conflict, global and local uh, crises. Uh, we mainly focus on two questions. Uh, what, are, what is the contribution of sense of coherence at the uh, collective level to health? And what is the role of sense of coherence at the community and national level in intergroup conflict? Um, I have, since I have very limited time, so I just mentioned that sense of coherence at the individual level was a main and stable coping uh, resource during COVID-19, uh, unrelated to grouping factors, and sense of national coherence was an unstable coping resource and decreased a long time. And this uh, coping resource was available only to specific groups. And also in the context of intergroup conflict, sense of coherence at the community and national level uh, were found to be related to less openness to the outgroup and more clinging to the in-group. So um, in uh, our uh, um, uh, breaking, uh, breakout room, we would like to discuss the following questions and share with you the results of our studies. And um, we hope to see you there. And open to questions from you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, I think with that we can move on to the second topic. Which would be this group of applying subject genesis to advanced Korean societies. Who speaks? Ruka? Claudia? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm uh, the one to introduce our working group. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Rosha Maas, and I'm speaking to you from Trondheim in Norway. Uh, yeah, our working group uh, wants to look at um, at uh, if we if we can uh, apply salutogenesis onto uh, higher levels as settings and societies, mostly societies, and. Um, this is uh, in line with what Shifra just talked about. I was very much intrigued by what Shifra and ID said. So now I just have to reshape my head a little bit. But uh, what we want to do is that we, we start with a concept of sense of coherence, um, as has been described here before. But uh, we want to look at the, the sense of coherence and how it is developed in an interplay with the societal resources, values, and norms. Um, that every individual finds in their surroundings. Um, to do so, we have looked a little bit into, in, into the books and the original theory, which actually says that the, the SOC is developed through experiences with societal structures. And these experiences will also be influenced by who you are. So uh, me and my brother, we won't make the same kind of period experience with the same structures. Um, even if we share a lot of personal or identity values. So how coherent our societies are and appear uh, would depend on your identity and your status in this society. So what we want to look is into how can we create coherent structures and processes to facilitate for coherent experiences for diverse members of societies and uh, try to kind of unravel how can a society facilitate for all its members to have experiences that are characterized by consistent information, um, opportunities to give feedback, experience load balance, and to participate in shaping this society in which of which we all are part of. Um, and we also want to try to start discussing how can these current experiences be translated into coherent coping strategies or also strategies for thriving and living a good life and maybe also for um, driving society development in a salutogenic um, um, way. Yes, so we had, do. yeah, sorry, Claudia, please. <laughs> Sorry, I thought that it was my turn. So yeah, I wanted to introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we will do this using examples where we already have um, starting points of this development. My name is Claudia Maya Magistretti. I'm also a member of the Global Working Group of Salute Genesis, and I'm also vice chair of the Global Working Group Vajora planetary health and well-being. So I link the two topics. And what we observe is that in planetary health, local activist groups already start this process of um, creating coherent processes and structures for people uh, when we face an overwhelming problem. At the local level, they make globally overwhelming problems like climate change or the distinction and um, extinction of plants and animals um, comprehensible. And they make them manageable by putting into action local solutions to address these global problems. And they give um, these threats also a local significance and motivate, pe motivate people to work together for change. And often, very often, they create new communities um, in this topic of people who were not linked before, also in including marginalized people. So they have a double uh, social and uh, health oriented um, way to create coherence because we know that activism in planetary health helps 
um, improves the health of the people they work, uh, people work with and of the activists themselves. Yes, um, we then we in the People Planet House project, we united a whole a lot of projects of, of activist groups in into a group and together we wrote a position paper to inform WHO policies in a novel process of global participation with the result that WHO invited these activist groups and the project um, to form a sounding board that will further try to make processes and structures um, coherent for the experience of people and meaningful ways for coping with catastrophes like the planetary one and uh, planetary health catastrophe is one. Please, Matthew. Thanks, Claudia. Um, another example of the importance of salutogenesis to build coherent societies uh, is the example of the COVID-19 pandemics. Um, during an emergency such as the COVID pandemic or any other emergency, uh, the interplay between communication strategies and media discourses generates psychosocial impact on mental health especially uh, in a context where there is an unprecedented volume of media dissemination and consumption. Um, with the evolution of the pandemic, fear has permeated societies, exacerbating uh, social tensions uh, and especially affecting marginalized populations. And um, while fear may stimulate preventive behaviors, uh, extreme fear can also lead to psychological or behavioral outcomes and inadequate uh, political responses. But what we look, it was that societies with better mental health outcomes uh, were also societies with people with higher, le higher level of sense of coherence. Uh, one study that uh, I undertook with colleagues have had had identified various risk and protective factors associated with um, uh, generalized anxiety and uh, depressive symptoms uh, during the pandemic. And of all the factors studied, uh, the SOC, the sense of coherence, was by far the protective factor, which was the most strongly linked with less symptoms of anxiety and depression in times of pandemic. Uh, this was uh, this was a significant result in a sample of 8,800 uh, adults in eight countries from four continents around the world. So, in conclusion, uh, I think uh, to advance with societies who better cope with public health emergencies uh, or any emergencies at all, we must build societies with higher sense of coherence. So. That was my, my pitch. <laughs> and these are the questions we are going to talk about. First, we will talk about your questions, of course, in the breakout room. And then I give it over to the next group. OK, uh, then we are. It's our group, isn't it? Definitely, yes, Lenica. OK, so go, Banks. Go, go, go. <laughs> it's your turn to uh, show what we're doing in our workshop. Okay, don't be so wild now, little <laughs> children. Peacefully, peacefully. Uh, we are going to talk about how the salutogenic process starts in life and, uh, and focusing on the beginning of life. Uh, when I talked to Aaron Antonovsky years ago, he said he doesn't know anything about children. And, and if you think about where and when this was developed in, in the life stage, it was developed among uh, middle-aged women still fertile who were moving on to not being fertile. And that leaves the spectrum. How does this process, process begin at all in your life? I put on my salutogenic sort of uh, glasses to have a look at that. And there are, of course, many thoughts and theories from the beginning of life and uh, we will try to uh, show this to you and mainly getting you to reflect into this. We are going to use a short documentary, documentary video 
from a person who actually was in a very severe situation, a mother who actually didn't get the chance to have her child because she was in Auschwitz. And uh, Dr. Mengele made, stopped uh, the life of that child. And you are going to see this and start to think about how does this actually start in, in my life by going back to see at your first memories. And we are going to have a, a special way of, of doing this. You will be have to, you will have to think and, and exp, uh, of your own experience to get this going. And Lenneke van Ragen and Laura Baumann, both actually from Holland, from the Netherlands, are the ones who will sort of frame this to you. And I hope you will have an exciting and wonderful sort of moment with us. This is all I want to say, Lenneke and Laura, please. Yeah, if you just want to, to add, uh, my name is Lenneke van Drager. I'm from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And for me, I have to learn by experience. And we want to take you through an experience today where you can also think about uh, your own life situation. Laura. Yes, Laura here, also from Wageningen University, the Netherlands, but speaking to you from the south of France. It's beautiful, beautiful weather in here. And I just want to want to share with you that uh, also this place where I am now goes way back to my childhood memories and makes me really feel very, very special. And this way of, of, of reflecting on our childhood memories, I'm very much looking forward to do that with you. Okay, Good. over to the next. Okay, that uh, would be me. Uh, together with uh, Shifari uh, Shori, we will uh, introduce you to this uh, topic for health beyond ease and the individual. Uh, now I just would like to justify why it's, I think, uh, important to ask this question. Um, as you probably know, Antonovsky really always started with his basic assumptions in his thinking and writing that we are all living in a dangerous river of life. So I was always a little bit, hmm, let's say, irritated by this statement because I thought, well, that's certainly true for certain situations in my life and also others' life, but probably it's not well capturing the full uh, life experience. Uh, particularly when we look into even the fields and practice of health promotion, when you know health promotion is really about uh, focusing on resources and promoting positive health outcomes. Um, it's already in the definition of the WHO Ottawa Charter that health is a positive concept, emphasizing social and personal resources. So it sounds a little bit different than a dangerous river of life. When we can even look at this idea of settings, our everyday life, the places where we learn, like now, work, where you also work a lot, where you play and even love. Would you describe this as all and always a dangerous river of life? I would have huge question marks. So that was always my own personal expression. So I thought, yeah, why couldn't we just ask people? So we had this opportunity of conducting a huge study just the end of last year, actually, still in COVID times, 18,000 employees, 35 countries, and there I just added this one uh, single item question. Uh, do you perceive your life rather like here on the left hand side as swimming in a river full of danger and I fight uh, for survival? Or on the seven point liquid scale on the right hand side, my life is like swimming in a river full of enrichment and I thrive in it. And here you see the results about eight, uh, across 18,000 people from uh, 35 countries. And you see 80% are either in the middle or more towards the right hand side of this thriving river. And only 20% are really uh, scale value one to three. And even only 2.8% are really saying I'm fully and only in this dangerous river of life. So I'm not saying that we should dismiss this idea that often uh, we are also certainly struggling for survival, but that should be complemented by this positive notion of life that there are also very positive aspects. And just to let you know, the lowest value we found across these 35 countries, which really uh, cover all uh, actually all regions of the world, was 70% of this in the screen uh, level. So it's really something in all countries um, can be experienced as very positive over all that. And this is exactly, I think, an argument uh, for this completed solitogenic model, uh, which I had uh, shown before. 
And during my sub session, I would like to show you this specific example of how uh, also when we look not only at positive health, but also beyond the individual, how a positive healthy organization could look like, how we could define that. And that are the uh, two questions, Shefalin, I would like to discuss with you, how would you define and apply positive health in your own research or practice? And secondly, if you think there is something like positive health and something uh, like health beyond even the individual, how would you look at that? that health as more a systemic entity also of societies, organizations, and so on. Looking forward to our discussions. Yes, uh, so the fifth uh, topic um, is salutogenesis guiding health promotion action. And um, I'm Marguerite Daniel from uh, Bergen in Norway, and Eva Langeland is also here in Bergen in Norway, and Luis is in um, Portugal, and the three of us will run this session. Next slide, please. Um, so Antonovsky, in the last paper that he produced, uh, 1996, um, suggested to the health promotion world that the salutogenic model of health or salutogenesis is a theory that could guide health promotion. But the trouble is, when you start looking at how Antonovsky defines health compared to how health promotion defines health, there's a huge big rift. So health promotion uses the World Health Organization definition of health, which is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. And Antonovsky thought this was absurd. How can you have complete physical, mental, and social well-being? And he said instead, and Georg, just one more click because there's a, a, a continuum, thank you. So he said instead that health is more like a continuum. And on the one hand, you've got dis-ease and breakdown, but on the other hand, you've got ease and health. And that we normally fall somewhere along here and some things shift us towards the ease end and other things shift us towards the dis-ease end or breakdown. Next slide, please. So because of this big discrepancy in definitions of health, when we look at how can the salutogenic model of health or salutogenesis link with health promotion, what we're going to do is we're going to link it with different health promotion action areas. So in the, in the Ottawa Charter, there are five action areas that are named, and I've listed them there on the left-hand side building healthy public policy, creating supportive environments, strengthening community action, developing personal skills, and reorienting health services. So if we then look at those action areas in the light of the key concepts in salutogenesis, which Georg introduced us to right at the beginning, and in particular, we want to look at generalized or specific resistance resources, so the resources that help us resist stress, but also the dimensions of the sense of coherence, comprehensibility, manageability, and meaningfulness. How do these things link? And next slide, thanks, George. What we're going to do in our session is we're going to, we've divided it up into three times 15 minutes, and each one of us is going to present very shortly some research that we've been involved in that links these two, some aspect of salutogenesis or its dimensions, and one of the particular health promotion action areas, or even more than one. And then we really want to, so the idea is to stimulate questions within you and get you to discuss. And so we really hope it's going to be a very interactive um, discussion and uh, you know, sharing of research that people have done in these areas. Thank you. Over, George. Georg. Okay, so thanks a lot uh, for all these uh, introductions. Uh, not surprisingly, because all of us are quite uh, excited about our topics, we are uh, 10 minutes uh, over uh, what uh, the time we actually had uh, aimed for. So this is why I suggest we now reduce just the breakout room times each time by five minutes. Uh, so uh, we just uh, uh, make that here five uh, minutes uh, longer. So we will start with this break at uh, 16.40. Um, now, please uh, choose um, one of the topics for now. And as Pauline had said, after the break, then you can uh, join another topic uh, to go into these discussions which have been offered by the groups uh, and do so um, uh, 
Uh, we take a five minute break now. So in five minutes, we will start at 55 instead, as we are indicated at uh, 45. So at 15, 55, please uh, be in your rooms. And we start with discussions. And then uh, we go again into these rooms at 16, um, 50, uh, 1650, yeah, 1650, please, again, in these other rooms. Um, we thought we still make, I still make a short introduction, but then we really would like to engage in discussion um, with you about uh, these ideas I had presented. Um, and for the first part, I will just uh, share my uh, slides again. I hope that are the right ones. Yeah, we can see it's a slideshow. Thank you. Yeah, very good. I mean, that I already presented in the plenary before. And um, again, I also heard now certainly uh, that you, uh, many of you work in very diverse groups with different uh, target groups, subpopulations, many uh, of you, work, but also work in this kind of everyday life settings uh, in higher education and so on. Um, and so my question to you now would be very surprised when you saw this finding that um, um, looking at our life really as always being in this dangerous river of life might be a little bit one-sided and that we really should complement that also by this more positive picture of life but in addition we often are also in this resourceful uh, river of life where we can be really full of enrichment and thrive in this river um, so very surprised by this uh, share of 80 percent being more on this positive side and 20 percent um, more on the in this dangerous river of life does that resonate with you if you're surprised maybe you want to give us a thumbs up if you're not surprised then you don't have to show any reaction <laughs> so most of you you would expect it like that so you can follow my argument that it would be good to balance uh, this uh, first research question of antonovsky a little bit and expand it which i will now show uh, on the next slide uh, as you all know, he was very much interested in this origin of health defined as this East disease continuum in this very stressful, dangerous level of life. And then certainly you look at life in, in such a negative only way, uh, then the only thing you can do really uh, equip the swimmer to become more strong and have a strong sense of coherence to survive uh, this deadly or dangerous river i think yeah, that's still certainly uh, an important approach but still i would like to add the second research question uh, what is the origin of positive health in a more resourceful environment that uh, can joyful and purposeful swim uh, in this river of life which certainly would move much more to trying to provide this resource rich environment instead of only make or increasing the fitness of the individual swimmer you would rather try to improve the river or uh, the living conditions for everyone. Uh, does it make sense? I think when we look into psychology, then it's very clear that there are two systems always a parallel going on within us. On the one hand, this kind of surviving system where we want to avoid negative feelings, negative experiences, and negative parts in our life, and we want to reproduce ourselves uh, safely really survive uh, well and maybe even pass on uh, to next generations but beyond that there is also always beside the human beings which really is about exploration we want to learn new stuff meet new people make new types of experiences really grow personally and last at least really uh, achieve our personal goals in our life and i think both uh, is within that uh, within us, and I think uh, in this WHO definition, that's already quite nicely contained, which really defines mental health here as a well-being in which a person, individual, um, in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, the person can cope with the normal stresses of life and can work productively and fruitfully. And last not least, even beyond the person, uh, we can make a contribution to society. I think that all resonates well with this well-known positive concepts in positive uh, uh, psychology, positive health of civic men uh, with perma dimensions, or the basic psychological needs of autonomy, belonging, competence. Uh, I think that's really, uh, I think a very good argument that we can actually talk about positive health as being more than just being at ease 
and as Antonovsky originally proposed. Uh, this is why uh, I am proposing this um, completed cytogenic model, where we just on the left hand side would not only talk about resistance resources, certainly we need sometimes resources to overcome or assist negative things in our life, absolutely important. But in addition, we should really also uh, strengthen thriving resources, resources which would allow people to make positive life experiences and also to achieve uh, their meaning and purpose uh, in life which would then certainly require on the right hand side of this model uh, to also add positive health and thriving as a desired outcome. Now I promised also to uh, apply that uh, to a healthy organization. Um, we have been doing intervention research in organizations, particularly around psychosocial uh, working conditions for a long time, and we found when we really want to create this kind of career and life experience in companies, in work sites, then we need to have a very consistent story, a nice, plausible, clear narrative uh, for employees, what we uh, want to achieve uh, together uh, with employees to improve the working situation. And this narrative uh, is really very well functioning when we talk about this desired balance between job demands and job resources as suggested by the JDR theory uh, by Bakker, Schaufeli and others. So this kind of balance I think resonates very well to people because everyone uh, experiences these two phases of work. On the one hand, this over demanding things which left us being stressed and can even lead to burnout. And on the other hand, with resourceful uh, aspects in the working environment, such as being uh, having some autonomy, having an interesting job, having positive feedback uh, from your peers and supervisors. And so this balance, I think, is very easy to comprehend and a very attractive goal. And last but not least, um, what do you want to achieve when you work? You want to uh, have personal meaning and ideally there is an organization which has a clearly defined purpose where you can contribute to this overarching purpose of your organization and research really shows when uh, companies do well in defining a purpose which is really attractive uh, to the employees together with employees then they are much more likely identifying uh, with this purpose of the organization and find personal meaning. So that's an example how we can move uh, this concept of health really to a collective or even systemic level of an organization, which is offering this balance and meaning to their members. So that's it for my input side. Uh, so maybe you have questions on that or actually I hand over to Sheffery who's our great moderator. No, yeah. I, thank you, Jörg. Um, excellent presentation as usual. Questions, please. You have any questions? I do have a brief one. Um, you mentioned that um, or going back to these eighty versus twenty percent, um, we all have these lay concepts of health, and people who are working. And you switch to that later on, where in this kind of fit situation between their context in which they're working and that they feel well there. How do we ensure that there is no inequity that you know certain settings are created in a way that certain people feel well there and others are automatically excluded but in the end all would report that they fit into their specific context I mean, that's a very important point in the slide i showed uh, this more morning afternoon in the beginning i also added this kind of equity idea uh, that coherent life experience should be really distributed in an equitable way. And I fully agree, particularly in organizations, uh, the higher up you are in the hierarchy, uh, as better educated, you tend to have much better working conditions. I, I absolutely fully agree. Uh, how to overcome when you really, over, uh, really include all employees across all different hierarchies in doing this kind of what we always do, workshops, where employees can talk about uh, the most uh, painful demands they would like to reduce and which resources are most important to them to survive uh, the working life and also to have a positive work experience. Uh, so you would need to include all people that they can equally uh, yeah, participate in this kind of improvement process. Does that Ilman, you have a question? That? Yes, um, it's, it's um, 
it's a kind of it's not a question but uh, um, a reflection. In my PhD, I uh, I made um, health promotion um, intervention in village 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 uh, to reduce brucellosis. And uh, I measure uh, the sense of coherence. Uh, I found that in the village with the worse, uh, with the high levels of brucellosis, the sense of coherence is low. You see, uh, and when I ask uh, who is the responsibility to prevent brucellosis, most of that people says is the government. And it was very interesting, this point. Okay, and what, what would you conclude out of that finding? So how could you then intervene in the groups which have this lower sense of coherence and this higher level of infections? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, what what are you doing with this result now? So how can you support those people with this low sense of coherence who have higher health problems? I think um, uh, we we may, and that's what I've done, uh, a tailored a tailored um, interventions, not uh, not uh, one fits all but tailored interventions and put them thinking about what is the disease. So uh, increase the comprehensive, the comprehension of the, the problems uh, and, uh, and also the trust on the, the public measures, something like that. Sorry, I'm not... Uh, English spoken. <laughs> no, we understood you very well, Irma. Uh, and um, a great reflection. Maybe we move because there are a few hands up. And if you have other questions, uh, you can ask later. Yeah, Irma. And thanks for your reflection. Over to you, David. The, the, the biggest challenge um, facing people and when they would need a strong sense of coherence is this continuity of change, uh, such as the pandemic, such as uh, it's okay looking at whether employment, um, but what happens when that employment is withdrawn? So that's when that strong sense of coherence is needed. And I wondered what research there was in that particular area. I mean, now you are referring to something, I mean, <laughs> The whole point is that uh, people vary in the degree of the sense of coherence they have. And it's not really possible in the short run to change their level of sense of coherence. So the only thing what you can really do is to try to build an environment where people find again more resources to deal with these challenges. So, I mean, there have been probably interventions, I'm not really was involved in that, but there are people who lost their job or really the amount of employment was reduced. Um, then it would be very important to bring these people together and at least to support each other so they would not uh, completely lose uh, the social network they had before uh, in their employment. I mean, well, there are I, certainly, I, yeah. Sorry. Hypothetically, let's say that there is some curriculum that could be designed to enable a strong sense of coherence. And of course, there will be challenges to that along the way because. Um, it's a, um, um, a, a homeoretic model rather than a homeostatic model. It's one that people have to move with the changes and accommodate them as they go along. And I'm just, um, I'm just wondering how you can build that into the meaning making um, so that people can move more smoothly. I, I'm sorry if I'm um, wording this question crudely, but uh, yeah. 
I mean, we can also ask others uh, in a minute, but I mean, again, uh, for meaning making, we know also from sociogenic theory that the key uh, strategy to increase meaning is really to involve people to address uh, their own situation and really to make meaningful decisions uh, which uh, for the life circumstances uh, they face. So as we heard from uh, Irma before, all these people who have this low sense of coherence and do not deal well uh, with this disease in their villages, uh, from my point of view, the strategy would be some community organizing fair in order to um, find out what are the hindrances, what is impeding them uh, to deal better with this uh, kind of disease in their village. Because again, you cannot boost the sense of coherence directly. Uh, so fast. I mean, there are some trainings which also show some effectiveness, but that's more a long term strategy, I would say. I think it's much more meaningful and powerful to bring people together to address their life situation in order to uh, boost the resources which help them to better deal with challenging situations or also achieving their positive goals. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Gwendolyn? Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering what you think about um, the fact that in, um, like in my research, I work with like uh, higher education students and uh, secondary uh, uh, school students. Um, and what we found was that they, the way they look at their environment and the assets and resources they have in their environment and what they, how they understand them, how they employ them, what makes them meaningful is very different for each student and is also fluid in the sense that in a certain certain situation or at another specific moment, they consider them differently. So we work with a group as a kind of a community, uh, like you in, in the in organizational terms, work with um, uh, um, organizations and people working in organizations. And I was wondering how you address the fact that um, you want to work with them as a as a group, but still want to um, uh, acknowledge the dif their differences in appreciating resources and uh, different meanings that it can give to um, um, certain circumstances or resources or assets they have. Absolutely. I mean, on the, on the one level, as you also already said, I think it's already very powerful when people, employees, or in your case, students just come together and share their different approaches, uh, how they deal with difficult situations, uh, but also how they achieve, for example, their goals at work or uh, achieving good uh, success uh, in studying. Um, because just by this exchange, already you get some uh, more social connectedness, cohesion, which is a very important resource. But you also can learn and get new ideas from others, how they deal with different situations differently. And already, uh, as we all know, uh, continuous learning is also a key element of solitogenic theory. So you also boost this uh, individual learning with very tailored uh, strategies uh, by hearing how others do. So I, I think that would be my collective uh, answer. I mean, on the collective level and on the individual level, uh, particularly in our field of occupational health psychology, uh, this concept of crafting is very much on vogue. Crafting is a concept which means that people are empowered to proactively shape uh, their meaningful roles. And this crafting has been applied very successfully to the so-called job crafting. So I very purposefully decide what is important for me at work. And what demands do I want to reduce and which resources do I want to need and want to boost in order to have a good working life. So it's a very tailored approach for the individual and the agency is completely in the individual. And the same concept has been developed uh, for off-job grafting, how I craft my private life around basic needs, drama needs, it's called detachment, relaxation, autonomy, uh, manageability, meaningfulness, um, and affiliation. That are the uh, six needs you aim for within this uh, off-job crafting domain. And I think it's a highly tailored uh, approach, very much along the line of solidogenesis because it's very much focusing on resources um, and uh, the needs, uh, the positive outcomes you would like to pursue. I just don't like the concept by as a standalone concept, because it puts all responsibility only on the individual. This is why I don't like it. But if it's combined with this collective approach, when people would come together and share how they craft individually, their working life, their off-top life, then it becomes very powerful. 
Excellent. Thank you. And before we go to you, Julia, I know your hands is up. Let me just quickly read um, Deep's question, uh, Georg. Uh, so, Georg, you mean that it is important to visualize the demands and factors that are challenging in order to build experiences to experience current work experiences? Absolutely. So, I mean, the basic idea is that each individual, as now also we heard in the discussion, is perceiving working life a little bit differently. I mean, I'm standing here probably experience that situation differently if uh, Gwendolyn or someone else would stand here right now. Uh, but still, there is a lot of commonality. Uh, I mean, we do know, I mean, we did studies across so huge companies, across all hierarchical level, and there are always commonalities that always people suffer from time uh, pressure, from unclear roles, lack of getting feedback. That's so common for many of us. And then the basic idea is that when you, uh, for example, run a survey or a focus group, and we really share this perception across many different people, across many different employees, then suddenly people say, oh, it's not only me who is having this high demands and high time pressure and lack of uh, uh, supervisor feedback, but it's really true for most of us in my team. And then suddenly it becomes a shared reality that we can also jointly improve the situation. I think this is why it's so important uh, to make it visible, how people experience their working life on an everyday basis, to make it something we can collectively observe and also collectively deal with and improve. Um, that's the basic idea. And what I meant with this narrative, I mean, when you talk about the simple model of demands and resources, this is really something everyone can understand. And we had uh, really experiences in uh, really even financing companies and like a bank, um, that they suddenly, when they took decisions on a strategic level, they always were reflecting how does that influence the demands and resources of our employees. So it becomes a narrative and a additional criterion when they take decisions beyond just financial outcomes. Uh, this is why it needs to be such a simple narrative everyone can uh, identify. Thank you, Doc. That was uh, very insightful. Um, I, I know there are two more questions there. Just wanted to let you all know that we're supposed to have some reflection. We wanted to give you some questions and all that, but I think uh, probably team is learning, a group is learning more by asking questions and clarifying. So we are perfectly okay with that. So get your questions coming. So Julia, over to you. Sorry for um, waiting for that long. I have a very quick question. Uh, could we study the political determinants of health in the framework of solidogenesis. Is it correct for you? Sorry, I didn't understand yeah. well. Um, Julia, can you type your question? Maybe that would be better. Uh, okay. It, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, meanwhile, um, meanwhile, sorry. Uh, Maria, do you want to share your question? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to reflect on what you have just uh, spoken about this group approach to cellotogenesis and how important this is uh, on this level because people usually um, find these things in common and uh, have more motivation for modification of their own approach. And this, this would maybe be important uh, since I work in a, in a clinical setting and group therapy is very important, especially for adolescents and young adults. Um, uh, so would you think that it is important to have this group approach to uh, cellotogenesis, not only in horizontal way, but also on a vertical way in, in terms of through, uh, between generations and that maybe all professionals that uh, get in contact with families may try to, to have this similar narrative that includes salutogenic um, pro promoting keywords that I can say, so that maybe there's an influence with the right narrative uh, since the beginning of life and for the parents to know how to vertically influence their children in a good way. Yeah, so if I understand you correctly, your idea would be that the same narrative could be started very early on already when a child uh, develops uh, from early stages, that you are not having such a, let's say, a deficit focus and only looking at the things which do not work well, but much more strong, strong, um, strength or asset focus, what are uh, really the capabilities of the child you really can develop well and that can really thrive in the future. And I think certainly that's a narrative which 
uh, plays out very nicely all during life. Uh, we had very uh, lengthy discussions uh, in the previous section when we talked about uh, dementia and how to prevent it. Um, and exactly where we had uh, the same point, but often when we look at elderly people at the very end of life, we only look what's not going good anymore and what are all the deficits and all this deterioration of health, basically. But besides developing dementia, there are a lot of things which people still value and find important in their life and where you can engage in the dialogue, absolutely. And this idea of doing it across generations, I would need to think about it, how, how one would do that. But interesting idea. Yeah, fantastic. Excellent. I work with women and children, especially children. I'm thinking of developing this idea with grandparents and parents. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, okay. So Yoga, I'm going to write to Yulia's question. How could we study political um, determinants of health in the selectogenesis framework? Hmm, well, interesting question. I mean, we would probably need to reflect what we mean by uh, political determinants. I mean, first of all, Antonovsky, also when you look at uh, the levels of um, general assistance resources, as he called it, he said it goes all the way from even uh, sub, uh, let's say, body level, organic level, all the way uh, to society as a whole, uh, even all the way uh, to political determinants. Um, I mean, if I would look at political determinants, I would again show which policies rather make it likely that people can really uh, develop resources, that people have a more participatory role in, in society and can uh, self-determine uh, what they consider as healthy and really pursue the health as they define it for themselves. Because uh, as we discussed earlier, Julia, um, I think it's very different what is important to elderly people. As it is true for every life stage, as Maria said, that we value different things differently. And, and that is really important to capture. So anyway, uh, my uh, recommendation would be would look at uh, policies if they allow that people can more individually and clearly uh, define what is important to them and that they can proactively participate in, in uh, good policy development and particular implementation. Maybe a negative example is exactly the COVID-19 crisis, where there have been a lot of requirements that people need to do, like getting vaccinated, and there was very, very little participatory approaches to that. So then governments were just not happy that people don't get vaccinated instead of getting them involved. Why don't you want to um, not be vaccinated? What can we do in order to improve this situation? So participation, participation, participation would be my answer. Excellent. So I think you all need a little bit of a break. And Gwendolyn has asked a question. He's been talking. I think you should get some water. We're going to do a discussion on what uh, uh, Gwendolyn has asked. Um, uh, uh, SOC is presented as an attitude, which is sense of coherence, those who are uh, new to this, is an attitude towards stress. Do you think, uh, we call it SOC, uh, can only be developed through stressors? Sense of coherence, is this only be developed through stressors? So you've been hearing from uh, Georg. Anyone want to comment? Other than uh, Georg first, give him a bit of a break. Julia, you was with us. Yes, I was waiting for <laughs> yeah. you to answer. Yes. Um, uh, we decided flexibly in the first part of the session that it's not about stress only. You could consider any biological, social, political, commercial mechanism which could maintain and sustain health, which could contribute to maintaining and sustaining of it's my comprehension. Um, Julia, you learn it very well. Okay, Gwendolyn, did you did you get that? I know there's a little bit of a connection issue there. So, Georg, if you're ready, maybe you want to share your wisdom nuggets here. Absolutely. I mean, let's look uh, back at this original model of cytogenesis. Besides sense of coherent, we have this coherent life experiences. And within that, again, we have, I come back to that, <laughs> participation at the very bottom, which will uh, develop uh, uh, meaningfulness. So that's by itself a very strong resource, uh, participation and being actively involved in decision making. Uh, and on the middle level, we do have this load balance, a balance between stresses and resources. Again, Resources play a huge role, uh, a huge role for this load balance, and we have this consistency. 
Um, again, uh, I consider that also as a resource when you have good narratives um, and a good understanding for yourself and also within the company, a shared understanding what the healthy company is about. Again, it's a strong resource. So for me, it's all about resources and stresses are just um, also reality, uh, yeah, which are, uh, yeah, yeah, anyway. Resources are much more important. And actually, we did research, sorry, we really showed empirically, longitudinally, but uh, strong uh, job resources. A good resource for work environment is also increasing ZOC, sense of coherence, and positive health outcomes, not only uh, stresses or demands. Excellent. And uh, David has shared very kindly. Uh, uh, David, probably you want to share about it? Yeah, it's just that if anyone's interested in the role of information, um, which is my particular, you, you mentioned resources, I think um, having information that's timely, that's meaningful, um, is, is absolutely critical. It's just a piece that I wrote for the, um, with the NHS um, in, in the UK for the uh, global social prescribing. Um, Alliance. So it's there if anyone's interested. Great. Thanks a lot. I appreciate much. Any other questions? Could I briefly uh, respond to uh, Georg's uh, response to my question? <laughs> because I completely agree with, uh, with your ideas about that resources are also influencing the, the, the growth or strengthening of the sense of coherence. Uh, and I think in my research, the, the, the input was not the stress factors, indeed. Um, uh, and I was, it's, it's a kind of a conflict in my head that I think salutogenesis is about positive health and, and assets and an asset approach. And the, the fact that you're thinking about stresses is actually going back to the deficit approach. So I'm trying to juggle that in my head, how that makes sense to uh, focus on stresses when you're trying to focus on assets and, uh, uh, and salutogenesis instead of pathogenesis and deficits. Well, I mean, my answer would be also what I introduced uh, earlier with this balance idea, but life also, I never ever wanted to make the impression that there is not also this dangerous river of life. I would suggest that we just acknowledge are always both sides happening parallel. Uh, so I'm currently working, I call it, I mean, I'm, I'm still struggling if I call it as a completed model of salutogenesis or a dual health development model, which I actually prefer, because it makes it very clear that on the one hand, you do have the stressors, and if you have too many of the stressors, this will lead to disease. And on the other hand, you do have this resourceful aspects in life, which will lead you to thriving. And both is happening in parallel. And more specifically, if there's certainly a cost uh, interaction going on. So if you have strong resources, it, this helps you also to overcome the stresses, so you will uh, develop less disease. So my recommendation is not an either or, but always a combined, uh, combined dual approach, because this is just uh, reflecting our life. Always, mm. both things are happening simultaneously. Excellent, very powerful. I saw so many nods on, on that, Georg. Any other uh, maybe, questions? Sorry, I, I, I just add something here from my yes. uh, um, experience also in, in context of organizations. I mean, it's required in Europe, on a European level, it's required to do psychosocial risk assessments, this, which conveys a job and psychosocial factors at, um, at, uh, at work are risk. So which means when you work, it's a risk. So better don't work. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Um, and when there are others, they're only running uh, high energy programs in companies or high engagement programs. That's similarly ridiculous because you cannot always be highly engaged and highly energetic because there is also stress. So this is why we came to this uh, conclusion uh, use a balanced approach because that's much more meaningful to our people because they always make these two experiences simultaneously. Certainly sometimes we are really stressed, stressed, stressed and forgot, forget about the positive side. Sometimes it's the other way around, but look at both sides. Excellent. 
So we have about 60 seconds left. Any final burning questions before the room is closed automatically and we'll be in the middle center room. Okay. Good. May I just uh, start on the top that you shortly present yourself and tell what links you to this workshop, what links you to the topic, what inspired you to choose this topic and what you would like to have out from this work workshop. So who are you? Why are you here? And what do you want to have when you leave this workshop? Okay. Elizabeth, please. Um, good afternoon from my part of the world currently. My name is, as you can see, Elizabeth. Um, I come from a management background and studied health sciences on top of it because I want to understand better how to promote the health of people who are working. So my focus is uh, work setting. And what really triggered me was what you mentioned in the, um, in the presentation of this workshop, the, the word coherent, because I thought, you know, you can have coherent experiences in any setting that are bad. Um, and you can have coherent experiences that are good. And that's the ones that we are striving for. And that's the ones that we would want to see more of. But to realize that it can be coherent and bad was really good. So that's why I opted for this one. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Gita, please. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. I have a dog snoring here behind me, but I hope it's not interfering <laughs> the sound. Uh, thank you for organizing this, uh, this seminar conference. And um, uh, what did you say I was going to do? Uh, my topics are nature and well being. Uh, from this cellogenesis perspective, um, uh, now I have gone to this um, more to this uh, culture thing, and um, that's the reason why why I choose this workshop because the society and the culture, and um, I like to to get some. Um, inspiration <laughs> from this workshop. Yes, that was short. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. Maybe you can explain afterwards a bit more about your linkage of uh, nature and culture. Um, I need, we need, we will need a bit more um, background for this to discuss your topic. Yeah. First, maybe we go on with Anna Marie, please. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm uh, Anna Marie Wagenmaker from the Netherlands. I'm associate professor at the Health and Society Department. Uh, and sorry, Anna Marie, you're hard to understand. Could you move closer to your mic? Your voice is very um, not loud enough. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? My name is uh, Annemarie Wagenmakers. I'm uh, Associate Professor Health and Society in Wageningen University. And um, uh, in the past, I did several projects in which we also used the sense of coherence, especially the SOC3 questionnaire, because it is very short. And we discovered, for example, that um, SOC can be increased, especially among people with a low socioeconomic position. Uh, by uh, doing health promotion programs. And uh, that's mainly related to um, we think empowerment and uh, uh, sharing uh, uh, stories with each other, that kind of uh, things. And um, now I'm uh, also uh, interested in looking at more uh, the community and society um, measures of a sense of coherence and also how to increase and that's that's why I joined this workshop um, that it is about more coherent societies and I'm also interested in is that also uh, related to more resilient uh, societies so the, the concept of resilience I'm also uh, interested in. 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, sorry, how do you spell your name? Deep Rage Tapa? <laughs> sorry, we cannot you, hear you. Maybe you're muted. Could this be? I think you're muted, yeah. Sometimes it's sometimes it's on your computer. <laughs> yeah, good. That's good. Okay. So you will present yourself as soon as the sound will work. Good. We promise that we start with your question. And um, maybe I start where you started to talk, um, Elizabeth, what is coherent, so, um, coherent, um, coherent, a coherent experience? And what happens when people make coherent but bad experiences, sort of, when they, when we use um, Georg's picture, when they are in a river where it's very hard to swim. And I don't know who would like to um, tell a bit more. Maybe you, Elizabeth, could tell us more what you what you connect to your question, what examples you're thinking of. Well, I was, I guess, basically struck by the idea that something that's coined positively in the concept of such genesis is, or has to be checked in reality. Um, namely coherence is something good in the concept, but we could, for example, any of us, I guess, has already made the experience or heard of it, that you have a bad situation in the workplace and you can't improve it and you make the same experience over and over. So that would be a coherent experience, but you couldn't change it. And of course that would lead to um, change your thinking about the situation. It would make you feel much less empowered and perhaps even helpless. Uh, would reduce your sense of coherence, even though you have an element that's absolutely coherent and would maybe even make sense because of the structure of the situation. So um, it might be that the answer to my question is that the elements leading to, um, or the, the experiences leading to the elements of the sense of coherence, they need to be positive as well. Or, and that's the question then maybe that's really behind it. Um, the, um, the research that Antonovsky conducted showed him that even these, these bad experiences that these women had in the Holocaust, um, which were of course also negative, that they too could promote something that strengthened them. And I guess I have difficulties turning my mind around that at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think I know what you mean, and I would have an answer, but I would like to open the discuss discussion now. Okay, welcome back. I hope you can hear me. Okay, very good. So now we had very interesting, intense discussions uh, within our five uh, sub themes. Certainly you only had the opportunity to listen to um, two of them or not listen, be part of and hopefully also spoke in two of them. Um, please be aware uh, that we hopefully recorded most also of the sub sessions. Uh, so you will be able to also watch them later on online on our Star Society. I will uh, present that at the very end. Uh, now we do have time for two minutes short summary from each group and please stick to this two minutes because we don't want uh, to keep people uh, to uh, not longer than um, indicated originally um, in our um, pre-conference we have two minutes each um, and so group number one uh, please starts with two minutes okay so um uh, we had very very interesting uh, discussion about the philosophical question of uh, the collective level of sense of coherence and a deeper conversation about ways uh, it might be uh, measured 
Several participants agree that the most likely measurement would be the individual perception of the collective level of sense of coherence, family, community, or nation. Uh, we also discussed uh, about the relationship between individual and collective sense of coherence, and we talked about the importance uh, of the cultural and society uh, so social context in which we conducted the, the research. Um, and thank you very much for everyone who participated. Well, that was very concise. Thanks a lot, Ali. <laughs> That uh, was a good example now. Uh, group number two, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we also have two very rich sessions. Uh, we talk about a lot of things. Uh, what I retain the most, maybe it was just my, my personal input, but what, what I retain the most, it, uh, it's when we talk about the place and of nature and culture uh, to build coherent societies. Uh, for some people um, who are more closer to the nature in terms of environment, they will experience positive experiences and this will, this will increase the SOC. Um, and uh, cultural ties can also help to strengthen, strengthen the SOC. When people move in new settings, they can lose a part of their SOC, uh, so they're going to have to find other resources to increase it. So that was interesting for me. We also talk about the, the suck of the communities, which serves to create coherent societies. And this leads us to highlight the differences between the suck of the communities and the suck of the society. Um, we also talk about uh, social participation, uh, neighborhoods and social ties to create more welcoming and benevolent societies. Um, we also refer to the different meanings of a sense of coherence for different groups in the same society. And uh, I particularly like when someone highlight um, um, the, 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 some, uh, some equity issues in comprehensibility, manageability, and meaningfulness. So that, that was the, that were the, the five things I want to highlight. Great, thanks a lot also for being very concise and very interesting. So it's a range uh, you covered in that short period of time, Mason. Okay. Yes, it's, I'm group three, thank you. I, we were trying to explore the genesis of salutogenesis and asking the people who were in the group to go back to their first memories in life. And I realized when we looked at these memories, we analyzed them a bit where we would have need a, a, a three week time to analyze them. But anyway, we actually saw that they, these were connected to meaning and these were strongly connected to, to social context. And uh, it was really what I expected, but I had hoped we would have more time to get it. But I, and anyway, we got an idea of, of where we are going. Some expression in, in writing, some expressed in word, and some expressed it in, in a dimension we don't know yet. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot um, for digging into this uh, very origin of salutogenesis, and certainly it's something, um, yeah, each of us can maybe make this journey back and see where the own origin of salutogenesis is. Thanks. Thank um, group number four, we are already. We had four. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. So, hi. Uh, thank you very much for your very active participation. We had two very rich sessions as the other sessions. We were working on the topic, as you know, health beyond ease and individual. So I was asking Jörg actually before this, I was panicking what I'm going to share because it was such a rich discussion and key points, everything was key, but was shared. But I think what I can summarize what uh, the two discussions or rather the two sessions we had was development of interventions, uh, involvement of individual or, or collective at the society level, and also how we can enhance the positive health. So few things which was still resonating and ringing in my head very fresh is when uh, Georg actually uh, put it in a key words, for example, participation that before we develop anything, before we feel that anything would work uh, uh, you know, for a positive health outcomes, it's important that we hear from the individuals and the societies. 
let them participate before we decide what should be done. And he gave a very good example of COVID and then vaccination, where the participation from the society was very less and mostly coming from the government. So that was one example. I know I have to be, I need to stick to the time. And the second thing which was very important was that we should not just focus and not really should not, but there was a lot of discussion that, you know, uh, how we can engage individuals and also the community. So there was some rich discussion around it. So you have to listen to, stay tuned and listen to our recording to see what was going on in our, uh, you know, subsection four. And lastly, I think something which was very interesting and I am going to, uh, you know, think and ponder on further is that in order to enhance positive health, can we don't just focus horizontally. I, I'm going to use the exact words which was shared by the participant. And we look through, for example, generations. Can it be, you know, cultivated as such and then pass on to next generation? So like what Ben said, going back, we also want to see how we can go from generation to generation. Thank you. Over to you, Gil. Great. Thanks a lot. Very good summary. Very, again, very rich uh, for about sh short time you had. Um, now to the last group. Yes, uh, so the group uh, topic number five was looking at salutogenesis guiding health promotion action. So we had uh, to start three presentations, one by Luis, me, myself, and the second one by Eva, and then by Marguerite. And the three presentations started the discussion. Uh, in, the first, uh, in, the first in the first slot, we could not finalize it, so we took, we took the second slot. But mainly, what we could say is that we need, we are in need of more um, guiding actions or applications on how salutogenesis can really activate the health promotion agenda. And uh, so, Margaret brought us an example from um, Africa, where the very interesting approach to deal with um, youth losses was uh, uh, followed by her. And, and the research showed that the approach by salutogenic perspective could be really triggering. Eva also was presented a very interesting perspective. And some of the audience members uh, made very interesting questions again. So we are just starting, I would say, something on this topic here. And I hope that we can continue this further on. Great, thanks a lot, Ruiz. I think, um, yeah, as I say, I think this whole field of interventions still can uh, learn a lot from Salutogenesis, Genesis. And um, so we hope that our uh, sessions today also help to boost thinking and acting in this direction. Uh, now, the big question is, I mean, what would Antonovsky say hearing all that? And there were some people also in our group who always said, yeah, is that still in line with Salutogenesis? Genesis? When Shifra, I dare to say what you always tell me, because Shifra, I should say, she is this great person in our group who has this most close link uh, to Antonovsky in his thinking, because she was uh, the only, actually, as a no PhD student of Aaron Antonovsky and certainly co-developed with him this whole concept. So it's always good to have her as a kind of reference person. Are we still in line or not? And even if not, maybe it's not such a problem. So let's hear from Shifra. What would Antonovsky say with all that what we discussed today? Wow, <clears throat> what a question. What would Aaron Antonovsky say? <laughs> so being, if I pass the five minutes, you can stop me. So being the only doctoral student of Aaron Antonovsky, this question is asked very often by my colleagues, by you, as well as by old and newcomer salutogenic researchers. Actually, I'm deeply honored by this request, request, but I'm also very confused by it. Aaron was my inspiring teacher and later on a very stimulating colleague who changed my way of thinking. He indeed taught me how to think, but he never told me what to think. So can I answer your question? What would Aaron Antonovsky would say? I'll try to do it in the spirit of my mentor. And according to some talks that I had with him lately, in my dreams. First, I believe that Aaron would have no idea 
how salutogenesis will continue to be developed. Even in the best of his dreams, not mine, would he imagine that almost 30 years after he passed away, salutogenesis would become more than a new paradigm in social sciences and medicine. I feel that it became something more than this. Can I say a social movement towards a salutogenic world? For this development, I have to thank my friends here in this in this group of uh, salutogenesis, and especially to you, Bengt, that with your enthusiasm and compassion really <clears throat> pushed this move movement from the beginning. Moreover, <clears throat> Aaron could not have imagined that international conferences would be conducted on topics within this paradigm. And that so many papers and two editions of the Handbook of Salutogenesis would be published. Salutogenesis is no, no, no longer the strict and clear theory of Aaron that he left to us about moving towards health, but much more than this. Does salutogenesis for me now is asking salutogenic questions beyond health. And this was the topic of this uh, meeting and is even employing other salutogenic concepts rather than only the sense of coherence and to seek answers to salutogenic question. This was indeed the wonderful spirit, I must admit, of today's plenary, asking new questions, looking for new directions, suggesting new ways of thinking salutogenically. So what would Aaron say about these new directions? I'm sure maybe he will be angry because it's not strict to his idea but I am sure he would be delighted with how it turned out. After all, he didn't think of his theory as a perfect model of how things were. He saw it as just a beginning and hoped it would be a fruitful start. So this meeting today was really a valuable continuation, part of the progress. Some new questions were asked and I'm glad for this question that were not asked before. And these questions reflect a new view of the salutogenic paradigm. And you know that our, I told you many times that Aaron used to tell us, his students, that it is the question that the scientist asked that advances science far more than the answer. I'm not sure Georg and your group about, about the question that you raised and you asked. You know, we have a song in Hebrew, here is not Europe, here is chaos and the, you know, the world here in, I mean, in, in the place where we live is chaotic and here is not Europe. So the question about the basic philosophical assumption of salutogenesis about the world, uh, I'm not sure about this, that he will accept this because he based his theory on this assumption, philosophical assumption about the normal, the normal state of human organism, that the normal state is of entropy, of disorder, of disruption of, homo, uh, disruption of the homo, homostasis. And he used to tell me <laughs> this, as I was then a mother of two, 
children. Now I have grandchildren, but they were children then and juggled between family work, PhD studies and the some works together. And he said to me that anyone who has ever raised a child knows at a gut level what is entropy as a basic state of the world. So <laughs> I, think, I think that pure question, he would not accept this question about this basic assumption of him, of him which is based on his life. And I trust that this was the only subject that was not unquestionable for him. Anyway. Yes. Overall, I trust that Aaron Antonovsky would encourage us to continue this progress today towards new creative ways of asking and studying cellulogenesis. After all, he wrote, and I quote his last paper that I've heard today also, it is wise to see models, theories, constructs, hypotheses, and even ideas as heuristic devices, not as holy trust. And coming back to my talks with Aaron, in my dreams, as I told you, <clears throat> I also ask him, what is happening to our world these days? How it, is it that we are moving away from peace, away from social justice, away from equality, away from tolerance and openness to the other? For this question, I don't get good answers from him. I can tell you that Aaron was a real authentic idealist with a strong commitment to his ideas of peace, equality, and democracy. He was not only a prominent scientist in the world, but an active figure in the left-wing struggle in Israel. Actually, we first met in this circus of peace activists before he became my academic mentor. And it was much strong connection between us <clears throat> about these uh, problems of the world and view of the world. So our last meeting outside the hospital was in an exciting event near Gaza after the Rabin uh, Arafat meeting during the Oslo Accord between Palestinians and Israeli. And we both were uh, very excited to release the white balloons towards Gaza as a symbol of peace and to hear some peace ball bells. But at just this hopeful point, Aaron left the world. And we, and remained it to us to deal with where the world is going now. <clears throat> and we all know about the, what happened for the brave step, step of Rabin and how it has ended. So we have been left with no answer for these crucial questions. I'm sorry about it, about the, we don't have answer about the state of our violent conflictual world, not only in my place where we live, Adi and Sharon and I in Israel, but also other places in the world today in Europe, and I mean to crime. But I will conclude, how else, with Aaron's daily words that I heard for him, from him, clearly, and delightfully, there is much more to be done. Go to war. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Shifra. This was certainly a very full reflection out of your own perspective and that of Aaron Antonovsky. And uh, we really appreciate uh, this last uh, thoughts I think you shared here um, with us. I mean, I don't have the time and <laughs> would not dare to now reply 
that uh, you question my attempt to also expand the cytogenic model. Maybe I'm just saying one word. I mean, there is this big concept of pathogenesis, which is just focusing on one side of life. And then there's this huge concept of cytogenesis, which is really about uh, the positive side of life also. And um, so I think we could use that in this dual way, still certainly acknowledging there is a lot of conflict, there is a lot of stress and even war and all that, but still there are also other aspects in life and we should aim for balancing that in a better way, getting rid of unnecessary conflict and really improve this more positive side of life. But anyway, that's my perspective and certainly currently we do have quite challenging times and I wish you all um, the best uh, with these very difficult times. Um, but now I still need to say two things. First, I need to apologize because Pauline was supposed to moderate uh, the end of the session, but she, we lost her because she has um, uh, some internet issues uh, in her country. So this is why I'm standing here. And the last thing I would just now like to share uh, before we say goodbye is just uh, to see, let me see. Uh, what you can do when you want to hear more about cytogenesis and continue this discussion. Uh, those of you who have registered to the IUHP World Conference starting uh, tonight, actually, uh, please go to this workshop on cytogenesis and health literacy, where we really explore how these two concepts can complement each other to contribute to more equitable policy making. It's happening on Monday. Then we do have a really very rich subplenary on cytogenesis, again, about achieving social justice through socially coherent policy and practice, really digging much more deeply as we could today, uh, really into this question, how to move this concept to the society level. Um, and we do have a round table on cytogenesis around new developments of the sense of coherence and last not least, the workshop on the sense for coherence. Still a lot of opportunities here uh, to learn more about solitude genesis. And finally, uh, there's this handbook. The first edition was downloaded 2.3 million times. Can you imagine? I mean, chapters of the whole handbook, so many uh, distribution we achieved. And now there's the second handbook out there. You can learn a lot. It's open access, so you can download it for free. And besides this handbook, um, we started the Star Society, the Society for Theory and Research in Cytogenesis in 2017, uh, where you can join for free and you will get access to the recordings of today's session. You will hear mm -hmm. about uh, newest publications, will have access to the SOC scales. There is a discussion forum where you can post your questions. Also, if you have follow-up questions what we discussed uh, today, uh, please go there. That's it from my side. And with that, I'm now also in the position to say goodbye to everyone. Thanks a lot for joining, uh, even on a Sunday um, evening or whatever the time was at your place. We really appreciate that. And again, I learned a lot with this very rich discussions we had mm -hmm. also in the subgroups. Thanks a lot. Um, and yeah, please stay tuned to Saturday Channels and help us to make this concept even more meaningful. Okay, good. May I just 
uh, start on the top that you shortly present yourself and tell what links you to this workshop, what links you to the topic, what inspired you to choose this topic and what you would like to 